What is up, everyone? Welcome back to the Fitness Stuff for Normal People podcast. I'm Mariana, and I'm here with Tony. It is no secret that the fitness industry sucks, period. Whether it's the corrupt multi-billion dollar supplement and weight loss industry or the endless supply of influencers promoting anything to drive page views. The bottom line is we're not trying to provide just another fitness podcast, but completely change the fitness industry for the better by providing you with the knowledge and tools to cut out the BS once and for all. And today we are going to be talking about pro Biotics. I am so excited. Last week, we talked about the top five best and worst supplements. And we briefly touched on probiotics. If you want to hear more about that, you can listen to that episode. But here we're diving deep into probiotics, specifically what probiotics are along with their different strains and species, where you can get probiotics in your diet, the role probiotics play in human health, who may benefit from supplementing with probiotics, and how to choose the best probiotic supplement for you. Yes. And and before we get started, as a friendly reminder, the show is free, always will be free, but we always like to remind you guys that you can go ahead and give us a five-star review on whatever platform you are listening on. It really helps us reach even more people, and we really, really appreciate it. I think Tony was just letting me know we're around 1,000 on Spotify almost. Nine, we just crossed 900 on Spotify, five-star reviews. So close. 900 on Spotify. <laughs> And we and know Apple listeners are chugging too. You're not forgotten. Stuff. There's just like 150 or something like that. How yeah. many of you guys have done it? And we really appreciate it. And if you haven't, you can go ahead and take some time to do so. I yeah. challenge you. I bet it'll be a race. I bet you can't rate us five stars by the end I get done with this next ad. Ready, set, go. <laughs> Before we get into our sponsors of this episode, just a quick reminder of Fitness Stuff premium, right? If you really like the research aspect of what we do here in each episode, make sure you join us over on the premium side where we host the weekly fitness stuff research review where we actually get to dive deeper into the latest research addressing individual nuances and showing you how to apply it into each aspect of your life we took research reviews and we made it into a video audio audible form right we actually have a pretty sick deal going on till the end of the year you're listening to this on cyber monday is when we're dropping it but we're actually going until the end of 2022 here we're actually giving y'all 50% off your first month subscription because we know a lot of y'all want to try it out but don't quite know what it is. So for just five bucks on your first month, you get access to the premium Spotify or Apple feed. You get the weekly research reviews every single week, access to the Ask Me Anything episodes so you can ask your own questions as well that we're diving deeper into and get access to our special partnerships who we do not take any commission or payment from. We just offer and partner the best available names in health and wanted to make them more affordable for our members. Like Merrick Health, if you wanna get your blood work done, you can save anywhere from 50 to $100 off, or the Examine Plus memberships over 33% off, along with more. You can sign up for the premium research review down below in the show notes, and on to today's special sponsors. We have two of them. First coming at you is Legion Athletics, our best friend over on the East Coast. We actually talked a lot about them in last week's episodes, the top five best and worst supplements. And we also went over the most reputable and least reputable companies. Legion was along the most, but you should not be surprised by that just because of how much they put into science and research. They're almost more of an education company first, supplement company second. And funny timing for this, they just came out, I think literally two weeks ago with their first ever probiotic supplement. So if by the end of the episode, you figure out that it might be worth something for you. You can always get 20% off your first order or double points every order after that down below in the show notes as well, or by typing in FSPOD, FSPOD, checkout. And we also want to give a special shout out to Eat This Much, our second sponsor of the episode. They are a meal planning app and they are incredible for making your life easier. You can also set your own calorie and macro goals, get access to thousands of meal prep friendly recipes. And this is on their free version if you want to go try that out. And then their premium version allows you to plan a week's worth of meals at a time, generate automatic grocery lists, and you can actually use Instacart or Amazon Fresh to create those grocery lists, which makes it so easy. You have your groceries delivered right to your front door. You can generate automatic leftovers, customize every single day of the week, print and email your plans. And it just makes sticking to your nutrition goals a lot easier. It takes out a lot of the guesswork. It can also make it a little bit more exciting to try out new recipes, 
kind of experiment with what you enjoy, what you like to do, and change it up if you ever get sick of meal prepping, because that definitely happens. Mm -hmm. And you could get 20% off Eat This Much Premium at eatthismuch.com forward slash fitness stuff. And you can also get a free two weeks of premium to go try it out. So definitely recommend it. It's also great to try around the holidays. If you want some recipes, if you're getting together with friends, family, definitely know that's happening a lot. So you can get some inspiration over there. I've been using it more and more as the holidays approach. I'm just now mm-hmm. realizing it that I keep using it more frequently just because of how thrown off yeah. I get thrown off with meals on the holidays. I just got a recipe from them. It's a maple roasted Brussels sprouts with bacon that I'm going to be making and bringing to. Oh. Yeah. I'm like, it's so easy to. Wait, can so. you like actually screenshot and send that to me? Yeah. I'll that sounds, inc- I love mm-hmm. Brussels sprouts and those sound incredible. I love Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Brussels sprouts about- are also really good for your gut health. <laughs> what more will we learn today? Okay, I'm freaking pumped. This is going to be another one of those episodes where Mariana's going to be the teacher. I'm going to have her explain everything to me like I'm five so we can get a better understanding. I was telling you this before the episode. Before, I was just looking up random, like, let's see how many claims I can find about probiotics. Because this is something that I know, I would say 1%, 2% of the world of what probiotics actually are, especially the more you told me about them. But the claims that I see a lot of probiotic supplements range anywhere from just solving gut health issues like IBS to alleviating mood disorders all the way to specific diseases, even cancer, which is ridiculous. It just ranges. It seems like one of those silver bullets or panacea that just fixes everything. At least that's the hot topic today, which I'm sure it can't be that good. And that's an issue. And we'll get into this in the end of the episode. So make sure you stick around for that. But talking about reputable brands that you choose from and what to look for in a reputable brand especially looking for brands, and there's a few of them, that do not make those bold health claims of a probiotic fixing something. It is a supplement. We talk Mm. about that all the time, like a cause and effect with a single supplement. It's just never going to happen. It would be great if it was that easy, but it's not. And then especially when you extend out to your gut microbiome, which is so beyond complex and varies from person to person. So there are so many benefits to having a balance of good and gut bacteria, having sufficient amount, a sufficient amount of good bacteria. It is not going to cure a disease or make all of your health problems Mm. disappear. But there are a lot of potential benefits in addition to diet that probiotics can have, whether that's coming from food or from supplements. You just have to make sure you're taking the right ones and also have your expectations not through the roof because it's just not realistic. That's a problem with all supplements is they use their claims, their front of package labels to get money. And oh, we learned so much about that last week. It was so yeah. gross. <laughs> it was so gross last week. Usually I feel like those claims, like the big ones, like those come off of supplements that are like, that people don't really understand too well, like probiotics. It's a catchy word, but if you ask people, okay, specifically, what are you talking about? No one really knows. The general public doesn't really know what it is. So I think marketing Mm -hmm. takes that as an easy advantage of, oh, they don't really know what this is. So we can fill in that blank with whatever we want, whatever problems they might have. Yeah, I feel like it's Mm -hmm. always those supplements when fasting first came out. Oh, it's the cure for everything. But we haven't even learned about it for more than two years. We don't know what it is. Yeah. I want to preface this probiotic research, gut microbiome research. Anytime we do a podcast episode on the gut microbiome too, it is evolving rapidly. Also, specific areas are still in their infancy, and we have a lot to learn. We have found out a lot over the past decade. Probiotics have been used for quite some time, but the human research in terms of their effect on disease outcomes is still in its infancy. So that's just Mm. something to keep in mind. And also with anything before taking any sort of supplement, make sure you discuss it with your healthcare provider. Although one of the awesome things about probiotics is they have been shown to be safe for the general population. But of course, if you have any underlying disease, if you may be pregnant, breastfeeding, those are conditions that you definitely, definitely want to make sure you get a second opinion on. And we're just here to share the research with you, make your decision making a little bit easier, lead you in the right direction. So we always like to give that disclaimer first, but definitely important to understand, like Tony said, what are probiotics? And I think that that's, that's so important to know and that they're, because they are a combination of live beneficial bacteria or yeast, and there's other species like fungi, it's not just bacteria, that naturally live in your body. So mm. you have two kinds of bacteria constantly 
in on your body. That's gross to think about. So gross to think about. Just oh, yeah. just like crawling inside it. Almost, you can almost yeah. feel it. And it, it's good and bad bacteria. And we don't even we don't like to use those words good and bad. But mm. there is good and bad bacteria, which mean the good bac- bacteria promote health. They are used for if they're used supplementally or if they if their function is for a certain disease outcome, health outcome. They play a role in that. But bad bacteria are also important. You should have a balance of that. You shouldn't not have bad bacteria. You definitely want to have a little bit of it, especially when you think about sickness and health, getting a bacterial infection. If we were never exposed to the bad bacteria, our body would mm. not know how to fight it off. And we would get extremely, extremely sick whenever we're exposed to new bacteria. That is so-called bad in quotation marks, I say. And they're found in foods or supplements that contain live microorganisms intended to maintain or improve the good bacteria. So that's what probiotics do. They're trying to create that balance of good bacteria in your microbiome, normal microflora is what it's referred to as well. And that's essentially the main goal is to bring back that balance. And also a lot of people just take them, even if they haven't had anything that may potentially throw off the balance of good and bad bacteria, some people just take them as a preventative measure. And that's also okay too. But in short, they are the living microorganisms that when ingested provide a health benefit. That is probiotics. But the scientific community often disagrees on what these benefits are, as well as which strain of bacteria are responsible. Now, I think when you say disagrees, immediately that jumps out as there's no conclusion. We don't know. People can't come to a conclusion on what these may be. But in this world of scientific research, that's not exactly what that means. That means that there's a bit of research and outcomes that may say some different things, but those findings can still be significant. So some of these findings may be specific for a certain population of people or a certain disease or may only be seen in a really specific area. So there's a lot of potential health outcomes, but that disagreement alone can be really helpful in terms of guiding you on what to believe and not to believe because there is no complete consensus on this bacteria causes X, Y, and Z or improves X, Y, and Z. There are multiple endpoints, multiple options. That's why for a lot of people, maybe you try out a few probiotics, maybe you notice some differences, maybe you don't. Some work for some people, some don't. And a lot of that disagreement in the scientific community explains why. There are multiple findings. Our gut microbiome is complex. And I I really don't know if we ever in our lifetime will really see this consistent agreement. But yeah, so that complexity explains a lot of that. Kind of now you understand what probiotics are. And there are also, I just want to quickly mention, there are prebiotics. And some probiotic supplements are actually marketed as symbiotics. An example is the company Seed. So that means they're a combination of pre and probiotics. And prebiotics we've talked about before, they're typically found in high fiber foods. They feed the good gut bacteria. So that's what a prebiotic does. It feeds that good gut bacteria so that they can thrive and continue to grow. So it's also important to make sure that you are getting prebiotics in your diet as well. So prebiotics, are kind of like the fertilizer you sprinkle in, helps everything grow. Probiotics are adding existing yeah. bacteria into the mix now. So it's so prebiotics help grow, flourish. Probiotics is introducing something completely new. Yeah, prebiotics are like dietary fibers. Yeah, we did a yep. really cool research on that a few weeks ago. That actually, that probably alone probably made me increase my fiber intake the most. Yeah. High fiber foods are found in like fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, some of which can be really expensive. So that is something that can be really helpful if you do find an option that has both pre and probiotics. If you can't readily get those in your diet, because we do know how important fiber also is. And I also have to get a little sciencey here, give an overview of these what probiotics are in terms of their species, these strains, what do I mean by that? Why is it so complex? It's because there are so many different types of bacteria. And in order to study them, we have to understand these species, strains that they come from and their effect. So going at the broadest level, you can get 
a genus of these bacteria. And that that is the broadest identifier. It encompasses several different types of bacteria in the same general category, but with a lot of different characteristics and health benefits. So then you narrow it down and you get into species. And that gets a little bit more specific. All of the bacterial strains within a species have similar characteristics, but with some subtle differences between them. Then you get into a strain and that a specific strain is one type of bacteria. All of the bacteria identified within a strain carry out the same function within your body. And researchers haven't yet identified every single probiotic strain out there. And it's likely that they never will be able to fully capture that. But it's currently around 8,000 strains. It may be more by oh now. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So those oh are my gosh. the specific bacteria and those have a specific function in your body. And we will talk about that more when picking a probiotic supplement, how important it is that these companies really explain the strains that they use, why they use them, include the science behind why they're using these strains and are very transparent about that because that is something that is commonly misleading on a label. You will see a lot yeah. of labels having all these strains listed, but they're not actually included in this in a probiotic supplement or they have no evidence that they have any effectiveness. They might just be cheaper to yeah. include. So that is really important. What's Should, on the label, right? Yeah. That's like what's listed as you see listed, like strains on the label. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to tell them that I asked you if I should list out some of these strains and the names are just like, Oh my God. They're just it's a so tongue funny. twister. <laughs> so I do tongue twisters before every episode with a cork in my mouth to open <laughs> up my vocals. It literally, it's a freaking cork. I have it right here. Um, so like she sells seashells by the seashore, or like a tongue twister to do this. And she was just wrapping these off. I wish we had one of them just to give them an idea. Like I have one. Let's see. Bifidobacterium lactis, U-A-B-L-A-12, Lactobacillus acidophilus, D-D-S-1, both of which can improve abdominal pain, reduce the severity of other symptoms like bloating in adults with irritable bowel syndrome. So that is the specificity that you should be looking for if you are trying to choose a probiotic supplement. Can you just give yourself a pat on the back for nailing those two? <laughs> I don't know if anyone's listening here that took microbiology Ooh. in college or grad school or whatever. You have to know how to spell these bacteria, Tony. And if you spell That's them insane. wrong in microbio lab, you get points off for spelling them wrong. That's in my head. So just impressive. In recap though, the three zoomed out levels, right? Our genus is up top. Genus is up top. Species of bacteria are below that. And then specific strains are even more specific. So like the easiest thing I can analogize to is genus is the United States, like the country of the United States. Species mm -hmm. might be state and strain might be like county, right? Like it keeps getting more yeah. and more specific, more and yep. more broad as you kind of move up. Okay. So the specific Definitely. strains though, are the ones that we want to start looking for when it's coming to potential issues. Yeah. That very bottom level. Of. And it's cool. You have the genus and species like in humans too, like human beings, homo sapien. So it's a typical, it's a, the same naming system there, cool. which is pretty cool. But diving a little bit deeper into these species, because different probiotics have been found to address different health conditions, choosing the right type or types is essential, especially when you are looking at trying to improve a certain condition. And again, we're talking about supplements here. So this is not the answer. It's just one piece of the puzzle. But each genus, because they comprise a different species, those different species can have similar characteristics, like I mentioned before. And the most common probiotic bacteria are lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. And those are the species. So I'll talk okay. about those. Those on sound a familiar. Level. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So those are species. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So you definitely want to look for, if you have a probiotic that doesn't have lactobacillus or bifidobacterium and you're looking for something for gut health, immune function, walk away. Throw it out. <laughs> so lactobacillus ferment refined sugars and create lactic acid. So what's really cool about understanding probiotics is you have to know their function. And these naturally live in the small intestine. So they may support gut barrier function, including improving digestion and bowel regularity. And they also may support immune function. And these also can help digest lactose. So then you mm. get into bifidobacterium. 
which are similar. There's definitely differences there, which is why they are divided. They mainly produce short chain fatty acids. So these short chain fatty acids we talked a bit about in our fiber episode, but these types of bacteria feed off of these high fiber foods, the prebiotics. And a byproduct of that are these short chain fatty acids, which play a very, very important role in a lot of metabolic processes in the body. And this bifidobacterium mainly resides in the large intestine or colon. So they help promote the normal inflammatory response in your gut. They also help digest carbohydrates. Again, like I said, those high fiber foods are mostly carbohydrates. And excuse me, (laughs) the potential benefits extend out to also immune function, digestion, and potentially cognitive health. So I say potentially because that's an area of research that is pretty open to interpretation as far as human studies go Mm. and still more in its infancy stages with how we connect back to human beings based off of any animal or in vitro studies. So what we do know is that there is a very strong connection between our gut and our brain. It's called the gut-brain axis. We have an episode Mm. on that as well if you'd like to listen more. And it is bi-directional, meaning our mood and if we have any mental illnesses like depression, anxiety, can directly influence our microbiome and our microbiome can directly influence our brain. So what came first, the chicken or the egg? You don't really know. So of course, that leads researchers to hypothesize that our bacteria and the balance of of bacteria can may definitely play an important role in our mood, our cognition. But in terms of that evolving in human studies, not too much really there. Okay. It's more so like this could have a potential impact. But yeah, again, it's an area where there's not as many strains that have been studied even in vitro and in animals. Okay. So just to recap a little bit. So those are two of the most common. Do you know, I'm sorry, so there's like 8,000 strains. Do we know roughly how many different species there are? significantly less right no there wouldn't be less i think that there might be so if we're talking about the gut microbiome you also have your skin microbiome Uh, okay yeah i don't know off the top of my head around and again this number might have changed i think i got this from like a 2020 study so they might have uncovered more by now but yeah i would assume that it's less because you have these broader species and they're going to be multiple lactobacillus, multiple bifidobacterium. Okay. And I was going to say, so for those two specifically, like those, maybe each individual, like the strains underneath them might not all share those, but that's like a common theme, like that lactobacillus yes, supports yeah. gut barrier function, helps support the immune system, helps digest mm-hmm. la- like lactose. That's a more common theme. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And then there's specific strains of lactobacillus. Like I mentioned that lactobacillus acidophilus that is optimal for digestive health Mm, for individuals with irritable bowel syndrome. Then you would have a different strain of lactobacillus that may be better for supporting your immune function. But they could all have those potential effects, but some may lean more in one direction than others. So that's why it's important to understand those strains because that's where you get into the more individual differences when you're looking at specific symptoms or diseases. But again, this is not like, these are not meant to treat anything. This is more so just in the understanding of the role they do play in our body. And then also the location. So location is really important to understand because these different locations translate to different health benefits. There may be some overlap as well. But again, if you have bacteria that reside in your small intestine versus your large intestine, intestine. And then you also have bacteria on your skin. You have it literally everywhere. So that location piece is also important. And then we get into kind of their mechanism of action. Like how are these probiotics exhibiting effects in our body? What's the primary way they're doing that? And this is more so just talking about probiotics in general, not talking about supplements like that the supplements do this but just probiotics generally the what good bacteria in already body. in your body yes okay. and i think that is something to me that i think is so important to clearly communicate because uh, correct me if i'm wrong but i think whenever anyone talks about probiotics they immediately assume supplement like thousand percent oh, a thousand so, percent yeah 
like you could just be referring to the good gut bacteria that you already have, not the supplement. So if I say probiotic, that's I'm referring to that, but I will specify if I'm talking about supplements. Yeah, right. Like people always forget about that. It's like when we say, yeah, the mode of action of these probiotics, we're not talking about if you're taking a supplement, we're talking about what it's already doing in your body. Yeah. And this helps to explain, okay, why is it important that I have enough of these? Because they do play this role. It's like when we talk about a deficiency, again, it's not the same thing, but if we're talking about a vitamin deficiency, what does vitamin C do in our body? Why is it so important that we have that? So again, it's a lot more complex when we are talking about probiotics and understanding that is very different, but there's the same principle there of we need to understand what they do in order to even get anywhere in terms of making any sort of hypothesis about their supplementing with them. So they can modulate your immune function, produce organic acids and antimicrobial compounds. So that's when you can get into the immune function a little bit deeper. What do they do that may help with your immune response? They interact with other resident microbiota. So good gut bacteria, it will interact with the bad gut bacteria. It's why I'm not sure if you've ever had like one of your primary care doctors or any doctor that prescribed you an antibiotic to take a probiotic after because- I don't know if I've ever had a primary care recommend that second step. <laughs> it's I've had like, one. I've had one. Wish we could do like a poll. I'm like, I wonder if that's yeah. just like a crappy primary care or- Yeah. Because when like you take an like antibiotic, you're also killing your good gut bacteria. I wish we could get into deeper today because I know that's yeah. a super interesting topic. Yeah. There's some people that just blast antibiotics and they have so many negative out- like health outcomes afterwards. What's going mm-hmm. on? You're just dropping a nuke on your freaking gut bacteria. Sorry. Keep going. <laughs> and they also can have interfacing interactions with the host. So that's you. In terms of that kind of gets into your metabolism. So the role that they may play in your metabolism can extend a little bit further beyond just specifically immune function. That's where you can really get into the nitty gritty of maybe this is why people with IBS maybe take this specific strain because we have a lot of short chain fatty acids in our body. We are bloating a lot more. That means we have an overgrowth of a certain bacteria. How can we bring back that balance? How is that exhibiting effect in the host. So host being Mm -hmm. us. So that's what that means. It's like these probiotics can influence externally how you're feeling. And they also can improve your gut barrier integrity and enzyme formation. So this gets into more of the realm of that. I'm not sure if anyone's heard of leaky gut or Mm -hmm. heard anyone talk about the importance of maintaining your gut lining integrity. So sometimes people can have an underlying reason for why that gut lining may be compromised. They may get really small holes in their intestinal tract, causing fluid to move in and out of our intestines. That's where you can get that leaky gut. And certain probiotics are very important for maintaining that strength, integrity of your gut lining. So that's where they can play a role just on a broader scale. It's so much more important than just thinking about, oh, I'm bloated. I need to take a probiotic or I want to have like good digestion. They can play a role in a variety of functions. Okay, so now it's time to get specific, right? And I feel like what a lot of people want to know is, but where does this play a role in their potential disease outcomes? Are they effective if you supplement with them? Yeah. Can supplementing enhance these roles that they play in the body? Is a supplement enough? to improve the quality of your gut microbiome. That is balance. probably a question a lot of people have, because I know we've highlighted this a few times when we talk about different supplements on different episodes. I know last week we were talking about it with collagen. We, we did the highlight on collagen protein, but we more specifically said that like supplementing with collagen, it would be nice to think it automatically increases collagen stores in your body, but that's not how mm-hmm. it works. You can yeah. take collagen like orally, but it won't increase your collagen stores. Yeah. So I think that's Mm -hmm. another one here. Good bacteria in my gut's good. You can put it in a supplement, but is that going to actually impact what's going on inside? That's a great question to go into. So we'll definitely discuss that a little bit more towards the end or as we go along. I really want to talk about the impact on digestive health. So we have to look a little bit deeper into our gut flora. So I will be talking a lot and I have talked a lot in the context of our gut microbiome. That is the most well-researched area when it comes to probiotic supplementation, understanding 
probiotics in our gut microbiome. So that's what a large amount of this episode is going to be discussing. But we also have our skin flora and we have vaginal flora. Women have vaginal flora. (laughs) That's why there's so many different types that like different probiotics are for maybe better for gut health or immune health, skin health, things like that. But when we're talking about the gut flora, it is integral to health and associated with a variety of diseases. I'm not sure if anyone's ever tried to see a GI specialist, but it is one of the most demanded specialties because there are so many diseases associated with it and so many that we still don't even understand. And our gut is home to a complex ecosystem of 300 to 500. Oh, bacterial species. I knew I was going to answer that question for you. Yes. 300 to 500 (laughs) species. So we're not talking strains, the over 8,000 strains. We're talking species. Yeah. Yep. And this is within the gut. So not your entire body, but within your gut. And like I said, most is found in your colon and large intestine. So that's focusing on strains that are specifically found in your large intestine or colon is also very important. And this is also the last part of your digestive tract. So that's also something to hold on to because we will be talking about the quality and effectiveness of certain supplements and keeping in mind the fact- I was going to say, fact, having to get there, that's at the end. Yeah. It's got to not just get blown up in your stomach or in your small intestine. It's got to make it all the way it's there. It's got to make it there. And that's a lot of the controversy around probiotic supplements because are these things even living while I'm, if I'm yeah. taking them? So we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But the meta- this is so interesting. The metabolic activities of your gut flora resemble those of an organ which is really, really fascinating. It manufactures vitamins, including vitamin K and some B vitamins. They can turn fiber into short chain fatty acids, which feed your gut wall and perform many metabolic functions, stimulate your immune system and strengthen your gut wall. That is crazy to me. Like all of those little billions and billions and probably trillions of things going on inside your body. Getting into the impact of probiotic supplements specifically, on digestive health. So we know how important these probiotics are that are living in your gut microbiome are. We know that they are very important. So looking into supplementing with them, what does that do? What effect does that have, if any, for who? So again, in humans, there's a range of acute and chronic disorders that can be a consequence of perturb... I'm going to butcher this word. Perturbation. Is that what it is? Perturbing? That sounds pretty good, but I am going to make fun of you after this episode for being able to nonchalantly throw out the names of those first two probiotics and then Perturba- perturbation. mess up any smaller word. It just sounds weird. But that's just funny because the first ones, it sounded like you were speaking tongue. But I guess I could say abnormalities of your gut microbial communities, throwing off that balance there. And also, disclaimer, diet is the principal driver of gut fermentation and can greatly influence the functionality of your microbiota. Diet quality is the most important factor when we are talking about changes in your microbiome, having enough good gut bacteria that can elicit those positive effects. So if you are not focusing on diet quality and you are reaching for a supplement, do not waste your money. Your diet should be your first priority and then looking into a probiotic supplement if you do have a specific need and reason to do so to give you potentially that extra little boost. But that I really want to get Very important highlight before you go into those. Because, yeah, Yeah. because you're going to be highlighting some pretty cool overviews of supplementing with probiotics. But it's like you cannot forget. We talk about it all the time, though, like especially when it comes to you want to lose weight. It's like, okay, what supplements do you need to buy? Have you looked at your sleep yet? your step mm-hmm. count, your diet, <laughs> your, your overall routine. It's like these first yeah. things matter. These principles matter. And that's yeah. no different when it comes to yeah. supplementing with these, it looks mm-hmm. like. Now, much of the our knowledge about like probiotic mechanisms is based off of research in vitro and animals, cell cultures. That's where the field of microbiology has been freaking booming because of that to look at these, the bacteria on in cultures in a lab. So that is also something that's important to keep in mind when understanding the mechanisms, but this is very informative for why we have had more human studies because of these potential mechanisms. Are they displayed in humans? Can we actually look at that? It's pretty difficult to get a bunch of, you'd have to do stool testing to look at specific 
cultures, bacteria from individual people. It's more so interventions based off of if you're looking for specific outcomes, a lot of self-report, monitoring symptoms, which isn't the gold standard of quality for human research. These are great. Mm -hmm. There are some RCTs, but in terms of self-report, we know that there can be a lot of bias there when people are self-reporting. So I just want to make that clear. And it's just also important to understand the complexity of studying our microbiome in human beings. I was going to say, it seems insanely hard to control. So again, just want to make that clear, but there has been a lot of research in those with functional GI disorders. So a functional GI disorder includes like IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome, IBD, inflammatory bowel syndrome or disorder. And other diseases, I don't typically like to call them because they don't have a known disease state. There are a variety of symptoms that explain this functional GI disorder. So IBS, for example, there are different types of IBS. There's IBS-C, IBS-D, and there are a variety of symptoms that people may experience. So there are a lot of underlying causes to IBS. It is more so a lay term to explain symptoms that need further investigation as to what's causing this versus with like a specific GI disease, the cause, there's typically a standard mode of treatment. So that's the difference there. And that's why IBS is so complex because a lot of people experience it differently. But research regarding the effectiveness of probiotic supplementation for the treatment of IBS is mixed. However, a recent review reported that there were seven studies that indicated IBS improvement with probiotic supplementation. And this included, I think, 11 randomized control trials, and mm-hmm. four of which didn't show any effect of probiotics. So having seven, okay. like that's a huge start for randomized control trials in humans, <clears throat> especially when we're looking at probiotic effectiveness and definitely a positive outcome for the IBS community to see that there may be some potential improvements here. Research indicates that multi-strain probiotic supplements seem to bring most IBS improvement, especially when taken for longer than eight weeks. So Mm. that's when we say like, okay, multi-strain. So having a bunch of different strains of lactobacillus listed on your supplement bottle or bifidobacterium listed on your supplement bottle not oh, okay. just one can be yeah, compared to just one specific which they could in the future yeah if it's the right potentially but the multi kind of covers everything up and this <clears throat> network meta analyses called low fodmap diet and probiotics in irritable bowel syndrome so the low fodmap diet is a standard mode of treatment for ibs symptoms so they were looking at the combined probiotic plus low FODMAP diet. And there's high quality evidence suggesting that the probiotic lactobacillus is effective for release of relief of IBS symptoms, including gas, bloating, discomfort after eating. And then the research also suggests that bifidobacterium can also be effective in improving IBS. So if you do have IBS Mm. to look for a supplement that includes both multiple strains of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. Okay. And then there's a little bit of research looking at just bacillus, but not as much, but it also can be potentially effective. So that is is huge that there is statistically significant results for the improvement of IBS symptoms with this combined approach of a diet and probiotics. And then they also looked at studies that just looked at probiotics alone, looked at the low FODMAP diet alone. Both were also effective in isolation. That's also something I wanted to make note of. Oh, that is actually pretty cool. If we only have studies that look at the combined low FODMAP, is it just the low Mm. FODMAP improving it? Is it just the probiotic? So there have been both done. Okay. So they both did help in isolation and they also helped even better together. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then jumping back here, what I also wanted to talk about, this has been, I think this is the, has been around the longest kind of these findings and in a clinical setting, knowing this to be true, but probiotics for the pre- prevention of antibiotic associated diarrhea in outpatients. So this is something that people who take a round of antibiotics and a very common symptom is diarrhea with these antibiotics. Mm-hmm. So taking probiotics can help improve that. And that has been shown time and time again to improve antibiotic associated diarrhea. Uh, Is it just specifically antibacterial? (laughs) 
induced or is it just that symptom overall, diarrhea overall? No, this is specifically antibiotic associated diarrhea. Oh. That was a meta-analysis looking at that specifically. But then when we get into, so say, individuals with diarrhea specifically, so like with IBS, IBS-D, that is a symptom of IBS-D. And it has been shown that there may be improvements in individuals with IBS-D helping to improve loose stools. However, that is something mm. that is specific to that group of people. There isn't any human study research just looking at like the general population. So that's really important for a lot of people just thinking about, I don't have IBS, but I feel bloated a lot, but I don't have anything else going on. Definitely look at your diet first. There are so many different things that can make you feel bloated. Don't just d jump to any sort of self-diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Also, today's day and age, especially with social media, making bloating to seem like it's some terrible thing. It's very normal for everyone to bloat. Uh, it's very Some people bloat a little bit more than others. If you do have chronic, painful bloating all the time after everything you eat, definitely go see a specialist to look at that. And that's where you can determine whether or not taking a pro probiotic in addition to whatever other treatment method may be effective. I was just thinking about buying that greens powder I saw on Instagram today. Greens Crap. powder. That was a joke. That was, I was being facetious for those of <laughs> We, we've picked on green powders quite a bit because they're marketed at bloating, but yeah. <clears throat> that was being facetious. That, that's just something I like to emphasize. If Don't listen to this and be like, oh, I get bloated sometimes. I don't like it. Like maybe I have IBS. I should just take a probiotic. Like you have to think about the level as to which, okay, is this normal or do I just not like the way my bloating looks and don't yeah. want to be bloated all the time? Yeah. There's so many levels of bloating too. For bloating, the probiotic isn't going to tell you what that is. So it's still important to figure out what that may be if you're chronically bloated all the time. It's not just yeah. an excuse to go take something to cover up a symptom, potentially. Yeah. So that is talking about yes, specifically. And then there was another, this is a specific study. So I believe that this was included in the review for IBS, but I wanted to dive into this one a little bit Specifically, alteration of intestinal microflora is associated with a reduction in abdominal bloating and pain in patients with irritable bowel syndrome. So it was 60 mm -hmm. patients with IBS, and they were randomized to two groups, one receiving 400 milliliters per day of a rosehip drink with lactobacillus plantarum. So that is the okay. probiotic that is added to it. And the other group was receiving a plain rosehip drink that had none, no lactobacillus. So again, this is a drink. This is not in capsule form. So they're mm. taking that into account is also important. But results of the study indicate that the administration of the lactobacillus plantarum with the probiotic properties decreased the pain and flatulence in patients with IBS. And again, this was self-reported monitoring of symptoms. And the, the drink also had fiber content in it, but the fiber of the test solution was minimal and unlikely that the fiber content had any effect. So okay. this is one form of probiotics and people take them in the form of Drinks, you can empty the capsule like powder, add that into mm -hmm. a drink, but there's different ways that you can supplement with probiotics. So the bottom line here, it, probiotic supplements may be helpful for those with functional GI disorders like IBS or IBD in combination with dietary in interventions along with proper stress management. So that goes back to our episode on the gut brain access. Uh, yeah, so, that's big. Yes. So there are multiple factors that could relate back to you having these more so symptoms that don't have a known explained diagnosis for them, you do have to look at the greater picture here. You can't just think that this is going to be a cure-all. And also notice that I didn't really discuss just generalizations, make generalizations to all people, because for a lot of people, a probiotic may not do anything at all. That's why it's really important to, before you take one, look into what it is that may be causing these digestive symptoms. If you have no idea, and this is something that is really affecting you negatively, go seek out an expert opinion. Again, I can't yeah. speak to individuals. This is the research that is there. We know that our probiotics in general play an important role in gut health, but as far as supplementing with them for just the general population, if you don't have a known imbalance, if your diet quality is otherwise pretty optimal, 
you may not need a probiotic. Yeah. So but, be like a lot of things, be intentional with it. Yeah. Don't just say, okay, throw this in the mix, but yeah. be intentional. Try and but solve it. But it also wouldn't with, hurt like to specific... try one if you don't have yeah. any, it's like for the general healthy population of people, it doesn't hurt to try one. They have been shown time and time again to be safe and effective in terms of the need that they are addressing. If you don't have that need, it's not going to do anything for you. Okay. Gotta be smart about that decision making. Now we get into skin health. Which is, I mean, we talk about the gut microbiome being complex. When we talk about your skin, it's all so complex. It varies from person to person. But a lot of bold claims you will hear, whether it's an influencer, it's the bottle, like a probiotic oh, yeah. curing your acne or getting curing your skin conditions. Like curing, that's not something you're going to get. It potentially yeah. helping with certain skin conditions maybe but this is also this is not the area that i am the most proficient in, in terms of skin health this is something you definitely want to seek out with a dermatologist however i will relay the research that is out there and it's definitely something if you're trying to figure out if you should take one it's not going to cure your acne but it is important just like any microbiome to have a balance of that good bacteria, whether yeah. it's in this on your skin and your I gut. Like, I remember I struggled with acne really bad in like middle school, high school, and had to see like a dermatologist about all this. And that was the frustrating part is because I know if anyone's ever struggled with acne, they understand it's like at first you are just you're on every Reddit thread and you're everywhere yeah. and you're trying every random thing. It's like this cures acne. Then you have to realize, oh, it is such an individualized mechanism that is going to drive you to stop getting acne that it's like not just one thing is at play here. It's cool to look at yeah. though, that probiotics in your body do influence skin health. So while to date there haven't been many clinical trials looking at topical probiotics for skin conditions, research so far does suggest that they may prevent the growth of harmful bacteria through competitive exclusion, which is like competing for the active sites of certain enzymes. This is totally just way too complex. I'm not going to get into detail, but certain enzymes that may allow a bacteria to thrive, function, elicit its effects if that is an acne producing bacteria, whatever. So competitive exclusion is a mechanism. The production of chemical substances such as thiocins, organic acids, and hydrogen peroxide, prom promotion of mucins, mucin secretion, leading to the improvement of barrier function, stimulation of defenses, release from host cells. This is super complex. This sounds like a different language. Production of growth sub substances like vitamins and competition for nutrients. Why did I even just include that in there? When you're probably like, what did you just say? This is, there are a variety of mechanisms that probiotics may play a role in. So these were just a bunch of mechanisms that I listed off that probiotics may be able to influence. That's um, a lot. I didn't know half of them what you said, but yeah. that sounded like a lot. Yeah. So when, but when Tony talked about, it's not a one size fits all. For some people, it may help with one mechanism or it may not at all. For others, they may benefit from something else. So there are a lot of ways that they could potentially, but again, very minimal clinical mm -hmm. trials. That's just explaining a potential mechanism. When you get into certain specific skin diseases. One of them, a popular one that has been studied a little bit more in depth is atopic dermatitis. Topical application of probiotics in research studies have shown some promise in countering the effect of the pathogenic bacteria that have been implicating, implicated in causing atopic dermatitis flares. For example, the exacerbation of inflammation and itching that is associated with atopic dermatitis. However, these studies have been small and there have been significant differences between studies, including the strains bacteria used. That's why I'm not really naming any real specific strain of bacteria. A lot of differences there, really not many conclusions, but some potential is what you can harm. I was going to say, that. it seems like there's something there. We have no clue what it is, but like we know something could be there. Yeah. Yeah. But again, that has not really been replicated in human studies, much little to at all. And then when you get into acne, topical application of multiple strains of lactic acid producing bacteria have shown promising benefits in reducing inflammation mm. and redness in those with acne. Again, reducing inflammation and redness. That's not in 
curing your acne. For some people, yeah, not solving maybe, where it's coming from. Yeah, maybe these creams that also have probiotics may help, but is it the probiotic or is it just the cream? Again, it's really hard to know. Researchers have discovered that this treatment may help by inducing anti-inflammatory activity due to antimicrobial action associated with inhibiting the growth and colonization of pathogenic microbes, including propion bacterium acnase, which is a strain that produces acne. So that's the potential oh. mechanism there. That is mainly in vitro in animal studies. Kill that acne is so complex, but this is specifically one single strain. That's why people, you're not going to be prescribed about, if you have severe acne, you're not going to be prescribed just a probiotic and be like, all right, go run with it. Might it help? Maybe, but there's no conclusion there. Okay. Bottom line, there's an important connection between skin health and gut health. That's what this tells us. There is an important connection. Increasing fiber in the diet, including food sources of probiotics and prebiotics, may help shift gut microbiota towards a more healthful profile. So your gut microbiome can influence your skin. That is more beneficial than looking at targeting topically your actual skin. That is the biggest takeaway. There's no defined optimal gut or skin microbiome. There never will be. Uh, but oh, if you are eating a diet rich in vitamins and minerals, staying hydrated, that is one really small piece of the puzzle. For a lot of people, you may be doing that and maybe rolling your eyes and are like, okay, yeah, another person telling me to focus on my diet. I've done that a million times. Like it is yeah. simply not that easy. But it is a piece of the puzzle is yes. what we're seeing. It's like your gut health does have a little dance or some sort of relationship going on yeah. with your skin health. So prioritizing yeah. overall gut health yeah. might I mean, be something that would help in the long run. Okay. What's that thing? What's that phenomenon that say you start taking a probiotic, maybe because you're taking your probiotic, you're supposed to eat it with food. So you're making a healthier breakfast and you're drinking a little bit more water. So I know what you're, it's some cognitive bias, but I know what you're saying where it's like, you might start taking the probiotic and then also be subsequently changing multiple other lifestyle factors that could also play a role into it. Yeah. But then when the problem gets solved, you're like, oh, see the probiotic. Was it that or the 10 other small changes that you might yeah. have made or maybe them all dancing together? Yeah. yeah. That's one so, th And that's a hard thing too, where if you ever do, I think that's an interesting thing. That's one thing I started doing more is making smaller changes. And I know you and I haven't talked about this specifically, but I'm assuming we both do with our own clients too, where if there's a thing going on where you're seeing a lot of progress over a long haul and you hit a plateau, the last thing you want to do is change everything at once. Yes. You want to identify what is probably causing that plateau and then fixing that in isolation because everything else was working just before. Yeah. Instead of saying, okay, or if you're trying to lose weight and you've never been successful with a diet and training and supplement regime, whatever it is, you really want to make everything change at once because if you see success or if you see failure, you don't know what caused that. And that's what's yeah. so important when you're changing things is to change one thing at a time instead of everything at once. So you can actually identify yeah. what caused that in the first place instead of just throwing 10 darts at a wall and hoping yes. one sticks. Yeah. If you see some sort of influencer taking some supplement and they say that it improved their bloating, so you go out and buy it because you want to get rid of your bloating. What's causing your bloating? Have you always been bloated? Did you make any changes to your diet? Are you significantly stressed? Have you been sleeping enough? Don't just jump to thinking that you're going to fix it by potentially covering up a symptom. And I feel like those with like IBD, IBS, Crohn's get very, very frustrated when you see people just advertising an anti-bloat <laughs> supplement because if only mm. if it was that simple, like these yeah. are mainly will help the people who just get a little bloated after eating food, which is completely mm. normal, completely normal. Yeah. So that's an issue in and of itself, but. Okay. So with skin health, we, we see it there. So what about, I know you, you outlined this, what about our immune function? Cause I know we talked about this on the gut brain access a yeah. little bit. We touched on it. What about probiotics in the immune system? Yeah. So the bacteria in your colon are an important line of defense against their pathogenic counterparts. So there is, a great possibility that the supplementation with probiotics may help in enhance immune system function. There is a great plausible mechanism there. Whether or not this works, we'll dive into that right now. Some probiotics have been shown to increase phagocytosis or natural killer 
cell activity. So this kind of helps mm. to engulf that bad bacteria, get rid of it. Natural ki killer cells play a huge role in your immune response to potential pathogens, invaders, and interact directly with our dendritic cells. So we have a variety of cells that play an important role in the immune response. That's the extent to which I will kind of dive into that without getting too complicated there. Probiotic strains can also increase levels of anti-inflammatory cytokines, such as TNF, with implications for abating colon cancer and colitis. So this is where you will get these outlandish claims that a probiotic supplement will increase your risk for cancer or cure colon cancer, get rid of certain... No. So Absolutely they'll take this and twist not. the freak out of it. Okay. Yeah. So because probiotic strains, again, we're talking about the ones currently living inside of you. I'm not talking about supplement. Because certain strains can increase the levels of anti-inflammatory cytokines. You hear, hear about TNF a lot in the inflammatory response, that does not mean that a supplement, a probiotic supplement is going to increase naturally the production of TNF. Therefore, you're going to kill cancer cells. That is how far you would have to reach to make that assumption. That's how far people do reach. Yeah. You can take a probiotic and it may have potential benefits to increasing the good gut bacteria in your colon. We understand the role that the probiotics in your colon play that absolutely does not translate into, oh, these probiotics, if I have more of them, they are going to get rid of my cancer yeah. or increase TNF production that will get yeah. rid of my colon cancer. No, okay. we're just talking so, about a role they play. And this happens all the time. Talk about a role something plays in the body. You extend that out to, oh, because these play this role, that means if I make a supplement with the same name of whatever this may be, it's going to have the same effect if I just take it exogenously. Yeah. We've definitely talked about that before. Even outside of even just collagen, like we talked about yesterday, but one of the best ones. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So if anything, this explains like why it's important to have a very diet rich in high fiber foods, vegetables, whole grains, a lot of micronutrients, also why micronutrients are so important. They help foster good gut bacteria. This further emphasizes that importance because those roles are critical to our health. But again, that is not what caused your colon cancer. That's not what caused it. Cancer is so complex. Literally anything that says it's going to cure cancer or makes claims towards that, run away. Because it, it's honestly disrespectful. I just think it's... Extremely disrespectful. Um, In my opinion, should probably be crazy. Yeah, That's another uh, it's conversation. just imagine if it was that easy. I can't. So anyway, chronically elevated inflammation levels. Again, inflammation is that buzzword. Anything, anytime you speak about inflammation, like people take it and freaking run with it. It's but, the devil. Yeah. But we know that that can also weaken the immune system and leave you vulnerable to potential invaders. And certain probiotic strains can help to lower inflammation markers like HSR, HSCRP. I think, does Merrick test for HSCRP? On certain panels, they do. Yeah. 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 So I think can... on the more comprehensive one they do, on our basic one that we put forward, it doesn't. But the mm -hmm. more extensive one, yes. Yeah. So here's a great example of where this may be impactful in a real life situation. If you go get your blood work done, say with like America Health, and you notice that your HSCRP levels are elevated outside of normal range, that can be a sign that you have an abnormal level of inflammation in your body. So maybe we address this first by a dietary intervention, getting some anti-inflammatory foods in there, like those high in antioxidants. Also recommending a probiotic strain that can potentially lower these markers of inflammation. That is a real life example of where that may be helpful and why our blood work can be impactful. But again, probiotics are a small piece of the puzzle looking at diet first and then looking into probiotics as a potential addition there. I was so. going to say, especially in, in this, I know we talk about the importance of blood work a lot, but getting something tested for inflammation, which is a buzzword, right? People think yeah. it's a bad thing. And it's like, no, I mean, because what's one of the most inflammatory, like pro-inflammatory things you can do? Exercise. Okay. 
which we, oh, <laughs> but exercise, which we know is extremely beneficial to our health. Yes. But that's one of the most infl- pro inflammatory things you can possibly do. Inflammation is not a inherently bad thing, but that's why getting yeah. tested for something like HSCRP, which I think I got tested a few weeks ago. And I think mine was on the higher end, but was still normal. Yeah. Still in the normal range. But why it's important because that's measuring long term patterns. Are you yeah. chronically elevated or? Are you experiencing this, right? Mm-hmm. It's taking something randomly to decrease inflammation, quote unquote, isn't necessarily a good thing if you don't have chronically elevated inflammation levels. Yeah, yeah. So that's a, that was why it was important that I specified yeah, yeah. outside of normal range, normally high levels for you. So blood work is so impactful for a variety of reasons. Inflammation in the body can be due to so many factors. We dive into diet, you can dive into your sleep, you can dive into dive into your stress, your exercise habits, like probiotics, one tiny piece of the puzzle that may help. And yeah. So some key takeaways to date, most studies on probiotics have focused on the effects on human metabolism, not on the human immune response. What does that mean? While it's clear that gut health plays a major role in immune system function, again, this is what I'm talking about. We were explaining the function that these probiotics play. It's too soon to recommend specific probiotic strains as far as them enhancing immunity because- We just don't have that research yet. More research is needed. It's just simply not there. But the potential for specific strains to I hate enhance like enhancing immunity. I don't even like that in in general. I think it's just your immune system function is due to a lot of factors. But in the future, there may be a development in the research looking into specific strains as far as them in enhancing immunity in, in humans. We're just not really there yet. So if you're yeah. taking a probiotic, like it's similar to like emergency, I would say. So it's extrapolating and putting words into researchers' mouths that were never said. So if you're talking about the function of vitamin C and the immune response, yeah, it's important in the immune response. That doesn't mean that taking excess levels of vitamin C is going to have make you have this invincible immune system. It's just not. Just because of the function of it, it doesn't yeah. mean that taking more of it is going to do anything. So. That's a very good point to add on to it. And I know, and specifically talking, like if you are someone who wants to get tested, I know we just announced this today earlier, but if you're part of the premium, right, which again, you could sign up for five bucks, you do actually get 10% off of your first lab or panel done with Merrick, and I know we mentioned because it's cool. We actually got to work with Merrick to mm-hmm. work on our own check-in panel because we we have the more comprehensive diagnostic, which includes things like HSCRP, but the more check-in panel that focuses more on metabolism, libido, testosterone, mood, cognitive health, and several other like endocrine functions too. That's like a hundred bucks, but you save ten percent off of it. So even if you just want to get blood work done, I'm like sign up for premium, get ten percent off to save potentially a yeah. couple like fifty, hundred bucks. If you are interested in getting that more routine work done, but yeah. And if you are someone who doesn't have blood work covered by insurance, you don't have insurance. This is typically cheaper than if you were going to do blood work out of pocket and you get more bang for your bucket. You don't typically on a typical blood panel from your healthcare provider, unless if you have a known cause, like they're not going to test your hemoglobin A1C, like they're going to test your HSCRP because that costs more money for them if you don't have a known reason. Yeah. Well, I've been getting tested. (laughs) I've been getting tested because I'm a type one diabetic. I've been getting tested since I was about 18, 19 years old quarterly. And this is prescribed by an endocrinologist and it's still more money out of pocket than even their basic check-in that we worked on them to make ourselves it's far more comprehensive for a fraction of the freaking cost i literally just after working with them in the past few months completely switched over to having them doing my blood work just because it's so much yeah. more affordable which is same here it's it really blows my mind because i know we talk about blood work a lot yeah now I, I wanted cool. to uh, yeah I, now i want to talk about this before we go into the quality of supplements and stuff like that because i know we touched on benefits on cognitive health i'm always super interested when there could be a potential here. And we talked more about that in the gut brain axis episode. I was, I think I sent you this study over before, right? And from the Institute of Psychology, it was really interesting. I read it It was really small scale, but I was like, I got to share it because I think it's something cool and shows more that there's something there. 
Now, researchers out of the Institute for Psychological Research at Leiden University, they wanted to test and see if probiotics could potentially make better or prevent depression. I always love studies that start like this. Now, they did a triple blind placebo controlled randomized trial, and they separated 20 healthy participants without current mood disorders. And they gave one group of 20, so I guess they, they separated 40, but one group of 20, a four week probiotic food supplement intervention with a multi-species probiotic while the 20 control participants received a placebo for the same time period. Now they use the index, the lead-in index is what they called it for the depression mm -hmm. sensitivity scale. So they ask simple questions before pre and post treatment. And across the board, this is what kind of surprised me because I know there's been so many conflicting pieces of evidence, but across the board, the group that used probiotics saw less aggression at the end of the study, less hopelessness, less rumination or just the engagement of repetitive negative thoughts and better overall self-control, risk aversion and self-acceptance when you compared them to the placebo group in these questionnaires. So I'm starting to wonder, and let me ask you this in just your opinion, for people that might have been struggling with anything that we talked about today, is it our mental health? Is it our digestion? Maybe not to the level of IBS, but is it just our poor digestion? Is it worth looking at a multi-strain probiotic to play around with long-term to see if they notice any differences in their own life? I feel like that is, especially if you're talking about, so these were healthy, these people didn't have. Yeah, these disorder, were completely correct? healthy, no, no previous mood disorders, yeah. Yeah, so when you're looking at that specifically, can it hurt? No, I mean, if you're otherwise healthy, like as far as the research goes in terms of the safety for the healthy population of people, probiotics are safe. Are they always effective? No. But if it is something for long-term help, that is comes down to your lifestyle choices, your habits as a whole in the long term. Taking a probiotic, if that helps you, whether it's directly or an indirect effect of you building just healthier habits. Can it hurt? No. Is it something you have to do? I personally don't think so because those lifestyle habits and dietary habits exercise, always, come first, yeah. always come first. So if you don't have many resources, that's where I would, especially financial resources, that's where I would push your financial resources into. But as, as far as the future goes of research in this area for mental health. As we are finding so much more about this gut brain connection, we also know that food and mood are so related. Your diet can really influence your mood. Whether or not that is because of how your diet changes the diversity of your gut microbiome and the amount of good gut bacteria you have, I think we will find that out, whether it's in the next 10 years, 20 years. Mm. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. I think it can. Okay, so if, but... if you have the resources available, that along with and second to investing in just your overall gut health from yeah. lifestyle factors like controlling and managing your stress from dietary changes could be worth it just because we know how important our gut health is and it plays a role. Gut health is important, period. Like that is something that... Parenting. You can, you cannot deny, nobody can deny that, but because of how complex it is and the s different species and strains and how they affect individuals differently, that's why you should always be wary of someone giving a conclusive answer to a question like the one yeah. you just gave. Um, yeah. But as far as trying one out, like for a healthy person, does it have the potential to do good? Yeah. Does it have the yeah. potential to have no effect? Absolutely. But that's the biggest kind of way there for you. And okay. if you're realizing it's not affecting you, like definitely try out diet lifestyle changes first. Look at your sleep, look at your stress. Yeah. If you still feel like a probiotic may be beneficial, yeah, go look at that. Try it out. If it's not working, stop taking it. That's the answer there. Hopefully yeah. there is no. more, we learn more in the near future. Because I think that kind of explains it for everything above. Now, I know you were giving me the lowdown on this beforehand. When you're choosing a specific supplement to take, and if you're listening to this after our last week's episode on the supplement industry, you're like, okay, how the heck do I trust any supplement company out there, especially one that I'm unaware of? How do you choose a probiotic if this is the route that you're trying to go? Yeah. So I said this before, but 
The bacterial strains that are actually in many commercially produced supplements don't match the claims on the bottle, which that is the majority of probiotic supplements out there. Okay. So that's why it's so important to get your supplements from a reputable, high quality manufacturer. So this is one of the very, very few times where I would say it's definitely worth spending a little bit more money for that quality because it, as long as you know what the brand is that you are investing into. So I would definitely say looking at three bigger things here, pre probably four, but first paying attention to the probiotic species and strain. So you want to make sure that the company is very transparent about the species and strains that they have and why. So mm. a reputable probiotic will and should have on its website a and of course the bottle, but more information on the website about these specific strains, why these strains are included, what health, potential health benefits they have, what role they play in the body. So that's what I would definitely, definitely check that off because you want to make sure those match because God forbid you just start spending money on something that you're hoping to improve your gut health where actually this strain really doesn't do anything for digestive health. So match the particular strain with published scientific research, the company should do that for you. So the second thing to look for when picking a probiotic supplement is proof of efficacy. These should be in any supplement third party tested. You want these companies to have a third party lab that ensures that it contains what it says and that the bacterial strains are alive and doing their job. So that these strains match the specific health benefit that should be clearly mm. stated, if not on the bottle, on their website. So definitely look for that. And then quality and quantity is so important. So people are like, how much, what type? Probiotics can be effective at varying strength. And most of these strengths are determined at CFUs. So you would see on a bottle like 1 billion CFUs per day of the probiotic. So, so scientific studies have determined health benefits from 50 million to more than a trillion CFUs per day. Oh. But there is actually a better measurement, a more accurate measurement than CFUs. So what are these FUs? Colony forming units. And also disclaimer, a lot of supplement bottles will put that like 1 trillion CFUs because you think more is better. More does not mean better at all. That does yeah. not, having more CFUs doesn't mean better quality or effectiveness. But these colony forming units, that represents the number of bacteria in a sample that are capable of dividing and forming colonies. They operate on the convention that viable microbes must be capable of forming these colonies, which completely excludes living microbes that have adapted to environmental stress by becoming dormant. So there are some microbes that do not form colonies that can have specific health effects. They are referred to as viable, but not culturable. So CFUs can also, that's a downfall of CFUs. And CFUs can also vary widely between batch lots. So what does that mean? So when you are trying to determine the number of colony forming units, you get your dish and you do your slab to determine how many units in the lab. Mm -hmm. That can vary from batch to batch. It's not consistent. It can be very ineffective for multi-strain probiotics. This is more... It's definitely something you can do with just single strain probiotics because you can really test this over and over again, come to an average of CFUs for just one specific strain. But if you're looking at multi-strain probiotics, which some have upwards of like 20, 25 different strains that require different media to grow on, this is very, very, very hard to come to a consistent number. What some other companies do instead of CFUs, they test probiotics for AUs, active fluorescent units, which is much more expensive, but it, this is more so the gold 
standard. An example of a company that does this is Seed. It's also one we'll mention at the end when giving recommendations, but this also goes into why Seed is literally one product. It mm -hmm. is very expensive to determine, measure these AFUs, but it is much <clears throat> more ac accurate. So what are active fluorescent units? And it's a more precise method for cell enumeration. What does that mean? They use a technique called flow cytometry tests, which is a high-tech process for counting viable microorganisms by a laser. So fluorescent markers are, it's actually so cool, are illuminated by a laser as the cells pass individually through a tube. So the tube will light up and that can, that illumination, those fluorescent markers can help you determine, help you count using the, this machine, the markers on and in each cell and give a readout of how many microbes in the sample are live and active. So that is so cool. I remember learning about that in school. Again, we didn't, I think in our, my professor had access to one of these, but we didn't use them. Our school doesn't have enough money for all of us to be able to use these. So mm. we did it in the other method, which is much cheaper. But this allows you to calculate a more precise measurement of all viable cells, including the ones that may be dormant. So you can capture those species that can still be effective. So that's the difference between CFUs, AFUs. Definitely much more, many more products out there that use CFUs because it's much cheaper. And then last but not least is package information. The front of package labeling with any supplement is very important to look at. The strain, quantity of CFUs or AFUs, serving size, health benefits, storage conditions, expiration dates, all of that should be provided on the label, mm. especially looking. And this is something that you're kind of like, well, yeah, of course. Supplements, again, they're not regulated like food. So even though it should be something they have, a lot can get away with not having that expiration date. Mm. Proper storage conditions, so, so, so important. <laughs> so I just want to list these off real quickly until, and then get into detail about why that is so important. So again, what should you look for when choosing a probiotic supplement? First, look at the probiotic species and strain to make sure they match with the scientific research on the health benefits that they may have. Mm. Look for proof of efficacy with third-party lab testing. Look at the quality and quantity, how many CFUs or AFUs are in this bottle. And fourth, pay attention to the package label information. It is way too easy for companies to get away with giving supplement companies expired products, not properly storing these products not disclosing what strains they are using, not telling you that these strains actually have no effect. So really look into that. So with probiotics, why this is so important is probiotics need to be alive and viable. They need to be able to be, they need to be living in order to exert their effects. A lot of supplements, these probiotic supplements you take, once they reach your stomach acid, they are dead. They do not make it past your stomach. So that means that after that point, again, where do most of these species live? Your small intestine, large intestine. That comes mm -hmm. after your stomach. So that is the biggest controversy about probiotic supplements. A lot of them in capsule form because they're not even reaching the area in which they have an effect on. Yeah. So the storage conditions are important. Looking into a company that no, is transparent about this fact. Have they taken that into account with how they design their capsules, how they store these, kind of the shipping handling process is also important. Sometimes you, the probiotics are not even alive when they reach your mouth because they died in shipping and handling. Again, some trusted brands that take this all into account. There's not too many, but I had mentioned seed probiotics in the past. They are one of the first companies that designed a capsule and capsule. So it has an outer and inner capsule to protect the probiotic from both the environment. So during the shipping and handling process, that's the outer capsule, which dissolves. And then the inner capsule survives stomach acid so that this can reach your colon and have an effect. So that is why, one, Seed is definitely one of the better companies. They are also rooted in science. So they 
have a whole team of researchers. They have a whole science board. They're not based off of curing, treating disease. They really speak to a lot of what we talked about here. The, from the first second you head onto their website, it should be a lot familiar with mm -hmm. kind of what we just spoke to. So they hit all of these that I just listed. They use AFUs, which is really rare to find. Again, I'm not sure if Thorn, I don't think Thorn does, but Thorn Floramend is also another. It's their similar price for a 30-day supply. Definitely on the upper end, around $50. That's typical for a high-quality probiotic. And then I would also say Pure is also a good company that has some good probiotics. They have a larger range. So it's important to pay attention to the specific strain for your specific need. And those would be my personal top three. If you're looking into trying one, Tony, do you have any more? No, I mean, I think we just covered them all today. I think I just looked it up because I know legions and thorns. I think the only one that does AFU is seed. I think that's yeah. the only one that goes mm -hmm. into it. It's not a deal with breaker. Most supplements. It's like, you should go with like a reputable trusted yeah. Company that pours money into the testing of their own products and the science in that field in general. <laughs> so it's yeah. like usually the same few, like Legion, yeah. Thorn, Seed, Pure. We also, if you want a discount on Seed, this is not a sponsorship. We don't get any money from this code, but I do personally have the code MARIANA in all caps. You can get 15% off your first month's supply so that if you want to try it out, get a little bit cheaper. Not a sponsorship, but not a sponsorship. They're a really good company. A discount code, which yeah. is similar to what we are trying to do with our Fitness Stuff Premium membership, offering discounts on companies that we think you guys can all benefit from that are very reputable in the health science space. And we receive no commission from that. It's really just to benefit you. It's a beautiful episode. <laughs> that was huge on probiotics. It was a long one. Let's hope we didn't get that it. That was a long one. I hope you guys, I hope people made it to the end. Uh, I know. I hope we made it. Well, there's a solid, I feel like you learned a lot on it, but I know, as we always say, hopefully it made your, your Monday suck a little bit less. You didn't get yes. late to work because you were sitting here watching this. Uh, <laughs> you are always our favorites for writing us five stars. Thank you so, so much for doing that. You can also catch our research reviews weekly, except for our AMA episode, Ask Me Anything, that we're doing this week, every single Friday as those drops down below. And again, it is 50% off your first month through the new year if you want to try it out. So just five bucks. And that is right down below. You know where to find us, fs.pod on Instagram and TikTok, Fitness Stuff for Normal People on YouTube. And you can find everything else out in the show notes below. <laughs>